Whiteout conditions. I haven't seen a blizzard like this in 50 years. You'd have to be crazy to go outside tonight. Small towns keep their secrets, sometimes for decades, until an outsider dares to ask questions. The president of Cross College was assassinated by a professor who turned the gun on himself in November 1963. Why? Well, that's a $64,000 question, isn't it? When John Pilot moved to faraway Cross Township, he left behind a life he was eager to forget. His new job at Cross College would be a quiet place to rebuild his life, or so he thought. Sometimes small towns reveal more than secrets to outsiders, and what was meant to be simple can easily become complicated. John, I want to be with you, but I don't think you're going to stay in Cross for long. And a mystery can be as powerful and irresistible as love. There's something going on here, and it's all tied to the murder of the Cross College president in 1963. John, it's not your concern. You really don't fit in here. For your own sake, get out of Cross while you can. And Pilot may self-destruct on his own if his imaginary pal Simon gets his way. Why not end this? Escape this veil of tears? Shovel off this mortal coil? Take the dirt now. Of all the imaginary friends in the world, I have to get the psycho who wants me dead. Everyone needs a hobby. The small town of Cross gets smaller as Pilot zeroes in on the decades-old conspiracy. What happens to a person's ashes if nobody claims them? And makes himself a target. Ultimately, this outsider will have to survive the elements, outsmart the conspirators, and overcome his personal demons. John Pilot will learn that washing his hands of murder isn't easy in Pilot's Cross. Hello and welcome to Mysterious Goings On. You probably don't recognize my voice. I am a guest host today. I'm Brian and uh, Alex interviewed me a couple of weeks ago related to the creative process. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a, it was a, a great time that we spent together. And I suggested that he being a, a very creative person as well, it might be a good idea for me to interview him. So on this episode, the tables are turned, <laughs> and let me introduce uh, author and public speaker, general creative person, uh, and a friend of mine that I've known for for a, a lot of years, a lot of years. Alex Greenwood, welcome hey. to the show. Hey, thanks. I love your show. <laughs> <laughs> Long time listener. <laughs> First, First time caller. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be on. And, and thank you for being such a wonderful guest, by the way. The interview with you talking about creativity in the food service product design space and how restaurants work and all that, by the way, it's one of the top downloaded episodes in the history of the show. Awesome. People love it. It's really great. So thanks so much for having me. Sure, sure. It's it's uh, it's my pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad I get to do this i know you know you would not probably have spoken as much about your process had i not uh, uh jumped in and and interviewed you so yeah. so I, I i hope the listeners will appreciate your you know revealing some of of your process uh in in this space as well yeah uh, particularly uh, i think it's kind of a twofer uh, hopefully the interview we'll both be happy with goes that way where you're not only asking me about my process, but we're talking uh, about uh, a book series that has is just replete with crazy, interesting stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And now well, we're now ten years in. Is that correct? This is of, our tenth uh, year of the John Pilot Mysteries, and I can think of no better month, by the way, than October to be talking about this stuff because you know this is the month of. Uh, most of the books, I, I know Pilot's Ghost. I know the upcoming mm -hmm. pilot book, which uh, I have not done the cover reveal as of this interview um, or the title reveal as of this interview yet, but, but probably will reveal it here uh, because by mm -hmm. the time this goes to air, it should be out. But that's coming on Halloween as well. Uh, October's my favorite right. month, and it's just right. so right. great. And so how wonderful that it all timed out what we're talking about. 
the mm-hmm. spooky subject in the spooky month. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well, and and that's something I hope we get into, which is the the pilot series is not only about mystery; it's about the mysterious in in a lot of ways, which uh, I think is is kind of fun. It it really turns the genre just a little bit. Thank you. I appreciate that. I I, I try to do that. So let me start. All right. By predating. We're, we're going to predate the books by 70 years to an inspirational event uh, uh, that, that led to some of the character development and, and some of the story development in, uh, in the pilot series. Yeah, I mean, in this true story, I eventually found a way to start uh, the the germ the seed for an entire series and yeah it all stems back to a fateful day april 25th 1950 at a small land grant college in southeast uh, nebraska and okay uh, so so let's ju- let's sure. jump jump in and say oh, okay so my first question for you then is is how did you learn about this story i was uh, a Few, just a month or two into a new job, I'd moved from, I'd, as you know, and some, some of our listeners know, I was originally from Oklahoma. I had spent about the first 30 to 33 years of my life there. And long story short, I took a job, kind of changed everything in my life. Uh, I'd lost an election and uh, I'd lost a, a friend, a close friend had passed away. My, my beloved grandfather had passed away. All this happened in about a year. And mm-hmm. uh, the company I was working for was starting to implode. It wasn't my company, but I was a, a VP there. It was just all the signs pointed north for me. It was like, get out of town. Go. <laughs> right. This place is not for you anymore. And so, as you know, I, I did clean break. I did something similar to what you did when you joined the service years before. You just, you just like, my destiny is elsewhere. And I left and took a job um, as a, a director of PR, public affairs, marketing for a small college in Nebraska, uh, it was called Peru State College. And Peru State is the oldest college in Nebraska. It was formed in 1867. Anyway, I was more or less the right arm of the president um, of the college, Dr. Johnson. He was he hired me, really charismatic guy. He and I looked like a good good team, a good unit. And that's a lot of my career before I started my own PR agency was that. I was usually the right arm to a C-suite executive. You know, PR people often are. Um, so anyway, we developed a great relationship. So about a month in, it's just funny, this is a tiny little town real quick. It's like 600 people at the time, and then less the school was in session, then it ballooned up to, you know, 1,500 or something like that. So I remember all, I, I, I was hired, and I was uh, I came into my office one morning, had my coffee, and there on my desk is this uh, big, fat manila envelope, like sealed, and there's a Post-it note on it. And so I believe it said something to the, it was in the president's handwriting and it was something to the effect of this comes up from time to time. Please make sure you, uh, you're, you're up to speed on it. Familiar with it. Okay. So I opened the envelope and there's uh, roughly 60, 70 pages worth, um, basically of the tale of a murder suicide at Peru state college back in 1950. Wow. So this was 2003. And I'm okay. reading about something that happened in 1950, and I read about it. the main thing, and I think I sent this to you, B, was mm-hmm. the uh, Nebraska History article by uh, Nancy Moran. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that detailed it fairly well, at least the basic e- events. Right. It's a good chronology, and it's, I think it's out of print, but it had that, but then it had, it had dozens of uh, affidavits, and it had crime scene photos and all this stuff, and I remember... Just reading it and not, look, not looking up for another hour. <laughs> so, so, so that was. How did they get access to? How did you get access to all of the? I mean, this was literally police statements, mm-hmm. not not information that's readily available to the public. How how did you get a hold of? Well, apparently, all of that? apparently, and I I later asked the president who didn't know a lot about it. He had read it too, but he had just read it, but he knew, he was like assigning this to me. And I asked around, I asked the librarian, uh, mm-hmm. uh Roger, mm-hmm. I believe, and uh, and a couple others and they said, "Well, there's a little bit more here and there." And they helped me with that, but apparently the school because it's an educational institution anyway, and the event happened there, they had mm-hmm. copies of everything. I didn't have to go oh, very far to find anything. Um, it okay. was all there. It was 
I mean, Brian, it was literally a gift. It was like here, <laughs> here's here's the here. story. Yeah, and and just <laughs> do you want me to quickly run through the story, or do you... yes? So knowing that, yeah, tell tell me what happened. Let's we'll, we'll maybe start with just that chronology of of the of the facts, and then we may uh, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, let's we'll try and add some some color or some uh, conjecture as to the to the why here here in a bit but start sure. with well it what was happened on that fateful tuesday morning in 1950 uh, professor barney baker uh, psychology professor he did his class in the morning and he, he gave three weeks of assignments going forward and then he said mm -hmm. uh, uh, that there's going to be half a holiday that day which everybody's like okay <laughs> um, so around 11 o'clock, he goes to the offices of the college president, Dr. Nicholas, and the and then the head of the education division, Dr. Maxwell, who was ostensibly the dean, his boss, uh, mm -hmm. and shot them both in the head. And then he calmly walked past, a, I mean, just imagine gunshots fired at an admin building, two different offices, people screaming, people running up and down stairs. It's 1952. Nobody's on their phone or anything. Everybody's just right. losing their mind. And he's calmly walks out to his office, drops the empty magazine from his 30, I think it's a 32 caliber, I'm trying, I think semi-auto, drops the magazine on his desk, puts on his coat, walks back to his house on campus, not far from the campus at least. It's a tiny town. It's not a hard walk. Mm -hmm. um, puts out a note and shoots himself in the head. And there he is. So, I mean, that's the very bare bones thing. And, but it, I need everybody to think about this was 1950 school shootings were not <laughs> the thing. It was not right. Like, right. People this heard about not this. a common occurrence, right? You know, it, it was not common and it made worldwide news. Of course it, it was reminiscent of another of an event I was unfortunately part of in my career later where uh, the, the terrorist attack in Oklahoma City and I remember just handling calls from all over the world well it was just interesting because there's do you if you read this in this piece by Nancy mm -hmm. the, the the basically the de facto PR guy for the school talks about how he's handling calls from all over the world so just think yeah. think about that so that's that's what happened in general you know why and how? I'll leave that to you to ask about. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. Let, let's jump in. There there seemed to have been well one he appeared to have been let go. Yeah, Doctor Baker had who you know he was the only PhD on the faculty in this area, I believe, and he, but he was not beloved, I don't think, and mm -hmm. he also had a lot of classes that weren't filled out and the school was there were rumors the school was going to maybe be closed and so they had to do some belt tightening and he just looked like the best place to do some belt tightening so it's not like they called him in one day and just flat out fired him and said pack your crap and go the president right. the, pre the president said i will help you find another job this is just for the good of the school and baker took it really hard really personally yeah. and sure. he this was not a crime of like i'm going to go do this he planned it He'd mm -hmm. written a letter, uh, a suicide note. He had written, um, uh, he had taken care of his bank accounts. He had taken care of his wife. He had taken care of all the things he needed to do. He'd put all his ducks in a row, and the last two or three ducks were killing those men and uh, himself. Wow. And and you know, what's interesting is I don't, there's some conjectures to that he, whether he really actually meant to kill anybody but the president. Um, mm -hmm. because like it was uh, c convenience because the yeah. other person would happen to be in the office. Yeah. Like he was walking by and he's like in for a penny, right? Might as well. I mean, there's some, <laughs> there's some conjecture there because I think some of the stuff he wrote later made it sound like Maxwell may have, what may, may be alive after I'm gone. And I, I'm not sure about that hundred percent. And it's been a long time, but I, I but it, either way, he murdered those people. He traumatized. I mean, mm -hmm. both of these men's assistants, one of the assistants, Dr. Uh, right. Dr. Maxwell's uh, assistant, saw uh -huh. him put the gun to Maxwell's head and pull the trigger. Maxwell never saw it coming because he had a habit of not looking up when people came in his office. He was always reading or doing something. And unless they addressed right. him, he just assumed somebody was putting a, you know, papers on his desk or whatever. He didn't even look up. But his assistant, she saw it. And, and so imagine that trauma. And then, of right. course, uh, uh, Miss Steppen, who was uh, the president's uh, assistant, she heard the shots, but but they mm -hmm. he'd gone behind closed doors, and you've seen so some she of, was in an outer office, yeah. and he was in the 
the, yeah, the inner office. Yeah. yeah, and it's just it's creepy knowing too. By the way, that uh, I officed in that building, right? And <laughs> yeah, I tried to remember. I don't think I think there had been some remodeling since then, so the exact spaces were no longer being used by the same people. And I'm probably going to get called out on this. I'm trying to remember, but I think that at least the office where Dr. Maxwell, the not the, where the, the dean basically was, I think that got turned mm-hmm. into a storeroom or a closet or something. Maybe it, it had, uh, changed the space dramatically. Yeah, at, at least. So who knows? But around 2003 through around 2006 when I was there, that's what it was like. And But it was, you know, it's funny because I, of course, I'd asked. You know, because I'd work a lot of late nights. I I had nothing else to yeah. do with that job. It was a very small <laughs> town. There, all I had sure. to do was I was also sports information director in a lot of ways. So I I would go shoot volleyball games, and football games, and basketball games. Go come back, process uh, the photos. I just had nothing else to do, so I'd mm-hmm. be there late at night. And I'm I'm disappointed to, to relate to you that I I don't think I was ever haunted by anybody. <laughs> no, no, no haunting. No pilot's so, ghost. So there, <laughs> very good. Um, so something that I found pretty interesting just putting things in 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 time and maybe in the the personality of the nation standpoint is that the murderer just calmly walked past the secretary yeah the the the, the female administrators yeah and, and it, it was almost like it was uh, i'm going to commit this heinous crime but you know, keep the women and children out out of it. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> just walks yeah, by. Right. You know, that's funny. No, it, it's not funny. Ha ha. It's it's a it's a it's interesting thing. And that the idea is that he he had his grievances, but mm-hmm. he he had no stomach for collateral damage. Is what I'm right, hearing too. Right. right. He, not only is it the semi quasi sexist of the time to to not shoot women and children, but right. But also, he, as insane as he obviously was in those moments. He, there he, was a clarity of thought. It was like you wronged me. I'm gonna get you. You know, right? And so that's uh, yeah. It's a great point. It's it's creepy as hell too because <laughs> when you think about some of the, the affidavits where they say I I ran I I was going up the stairs while he was coming down and he had a gun. He could have blasted away at several people, right? And right. just didn't. And 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 yeah. a couple of these people he didn't particularly like. Yeah. That, he, that he let that he let off the hook because they were young up and comers who were taking his job, but he didn't blame them. He blamed the bosses. Right, right, yeah. It, and it's, it's such a a an interesting. You mentioned the pre the premeditation of and, and preparation leading up to the event, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there was kind of an interesting note that he left about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, basically a, a handwritten will if you will yeah. you want to <laughs> yeah let me it, it's a, a short bit. it's short enough to where i could read part of it to you if that's yeah, what please. you'd like let me uh, yeah. let me dig this up here uh, okay. yeah this is from dr barney baker he left this to uh, to c a huck who was a part-time math instructor in, at the college and I, I guess the closest thing he had left to a trusted friend part of this ended up making it into the end of the book <laughs> mr huck please take charge use Casey of Auburn as director. That's funeral director. He wanted to use Casey. Okay. Auburn is the next town over from Peru. Services about $400. Cremate and scatter the ashes at night on the south side of the road, about eight telephone poles east of the Peru corner. That's basically where the... the cor- it's not on campus. It's where the you turn off the main road to get to the campus. Let only... Yeah, interesting. What can I interject? Sure. Is, yeah. is, is there something there? Is there something particular there? I think there is. And I think actually, because people were outraged and thought, oh, wow, he's going to, he wants to be, put his ashes on Peru College? No way. But mm-hmm. no, actually, like I said, it's like you go off that main road, off the highway, the state highway, <laughs> and you go down about eight telephone poles, That's there's a rise. And I've, of course, driven this a million times. And mm-hmm. it's beautiful at sunset. He and his wife would often stop and look at the sunset from there. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. interesting. So then he for, he continues with, let only one person know what you have done. Funeral services at chapel with Presbyterian procedure. No relatives are to be notified except Joy, that's his wife, who is at uh, in, in Oklahoma City. Stay in my house at night or get someone to until things quiet down. He put quite down, misspelled quiet, quiet down. PC might try to cause trouble. I think that's surmised that's the son of, I think, Dr. Maxwell who was kind okay. of a hothead and, and apparently did pack a gun and went looking with a mob 
for Baker after the shootings. But, of course, Baker, take care of this. You are to be right. paid for your services. P.S. Take charge of my office and bring everything down to the house. Signed, B.K. Baker, and then handwritten in ink. The rest was typed. Willie tried to fire the wrong person. Wow. And that would be Mr. Deputy President Maxwell. That's what he called William Maxwell. Yeah. That, that right there, Willie tried to fire the wrong person. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay, so so you t- you so this event happens, and in a small town, I mean, it, it, it made global news, right? But it, it's in a small town that must have just been a huge scandal. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, comments in Nancy's article and some other stuff I've mm-hmm. dug up where, you know, people are writing about it and saying that this is interesting to me. Uh, um, and uh, I, I'd love to, let me just dig this up here. Um, there's this great comment from some, from one of the local media, like from somebody who wrote like a little Peru paper and they had all these funerals and all these things happen, but the media attention upset the mm-hmm. residents of Peru a lot. Corinne Adams wrote in her West side items column of the Peru pointer quote, one of the hardest points of the week was the way the reporters and newscasters handled the affair, having a field day. Their methods seemed harsh and their product sensational. <laughs> it's like a, a double murder suicide. Why can't we get on about our daily business? Yeah, that, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's so funny. But the other part is just like, it's like today, we still say this about the media. Oh, my God. You know, mm-hmm. like if it if it bleeds, it leads. Oh, there's, you know, a house fire. There's a murder. There's a robbery. It's been going on right. for 70 years here, at least. Yeah, um, or more. I mean, or yeah. More. This yeah. Is oh, just definitely more. So, yeah. So, so interesting. So interesting. So, so now ba- let's, let's spring forward now okay. to, to, so you're, you've had this story you did with a, a lot of it given to you, but then you do some independent research. At what point did you, did it click that this was the seed of, uh, of, of, a, of another story? I gathered all the materials I could and I photocopied that entire file, by the way, mm-hmm. that the president <laughs> left on my desk and then some other stuff that I found and some other research that I dug up on microfiche and things like that. <laughs> and uh, cause again, you remember I had plenty of time when I wasn't working to sure. Uh, but sure. I, I, I ne- right. And I, but I was not in a frame of mind to, I'd written things before I had a degree in writing. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I had come off such a really rotten few years, you know, and I had a bad health scare too. So that's, and, and I'm mentioning some of this stuff because if you've read Pilot's Cross, you're going to be going, oh my God, he wasn't, he he didn't just borrow from, you know, history, he borrowed from his own history to a degree. And we can talk about that if you wish, but I'd had yes. a health scare, thought I had cancer, these things happened. And I just wasn't in frame of mind to write, but it was interesting, but I knew full well, because my grandfather, who was a noted uh, author of, of books for 50 years, you know, he told me about how things percolate, and I knew for a fact how things percolate in my own brain. So I thought, well, I'm going to photocopy all this, and someday I'll get to it. And it turned out that I left Peru to come to Kansas City and take a job at the TV station here, at uh, the PBS station, and to be, uh, uh, to date, uh, the young lady who became my wife. And I got an apartment on the plaza, the Country Club Plaza area, Kansas City, which if you've ever visited Kansas City, it's that really quaint, you know, like, 75, 80 year old shopping center, one of the first outdoor shopping centers <laughs> in America. And I had an apartment that overlooked it and it was beautiful. And I would, uh, I did the cliche. I took that packet of stuff and I went down to mm-hmm. the, here it goes, the Starbucks. And I sat there on uh-huh. my laptop and over, this was in 2005, 2006. Okay. I sat out there and for three months straight, I would go almost every weeknight and cranked out pages. What I decided to do was I thought, you know, this story has legs. There's some interesting things here. And my my plan was not to just blatantly rip it off and, and do that, although plenty of authors do that sure. with real-life events. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> but I also, having lived there in that town and knowing that even right. many years later, decades later, it was still a wound for that town. Um, yeah. But I still wanted to use it. And I wanted to use that town because I, I had fallen in love with Peru, Nebraska, and Peru State mm-hmm. College. And I wanted to do kind of a, well, anybody who's a close friend of mine or loves me or I love them, they know that, you know, with my love comes occasional 
barbs and problems and things. <laughs> and so I express, sure. yeah. So I express my love though for that town, and I made it into Cross Township with mm-hmm. Cross College. And I decided that that town was going to be the the backdrop for this 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 uh, story of a guy who. Here, see if this rings a bell for you. He had lost kind of everything. His his marriage broke up. His job fell out. He had a health issue, and he just took a job because he needed a job, and he didn't know anybody. Yada yada, huh? Makes sense. Uh huh. Sure. So, and so, I brought him to this town, and then I thought, well, what we got to do is we got to connect this modern guy with this old mystery. So I updated the the mystery. The murder suicide is pretty similar to what happened in 1950. I I moved it up mm-hmm. to November 1963. Because right. I wanted, you know, Kennedy assassination. I wanted that parallel of two chief executives being assassinated in, in, within a week of each other. Uh, one on a magnificently huge uh, macro scale and one, but to, to your previous comment, on a huge macro scale in a micro place. In right. other words, it right. was this tiny town, but it was the biggest thing that had ever happened. Right. Yeah. And this is, you know, I find this fascinating because, yeah, you you look at the assassination, which they were had just experienced in the in, in the book. Right. And that they experienced personally as as distant observers. Right. And then you you turn that to experiencing as uh, actively as as very personal observers and and that yeah i think that that changes the perspective i mean it's i think you can it, even something as as tragic as that you remember where you were and what you were doing and who you were talking to uh but you're able to um i think disconnect from it but an event that's personal in nature, uh, it, you experience it very differently. And I, I like that juxtaposition that you did uh, leading into the into the book. Well, thank you. You know, there's a scene where Dottie Mostak, who is the assistant to the president who's going to be assassinated, she's, she's still in tears at her desk reading uh, about Kennedy and the funeral and the picture of John John. That picture's mm-hmm. on the front page of the paper, and she's still there. And there's these gentlemen from the office supply store or whatever there to—, to 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 try to get a new contract and they're out in the ante room and it's all and they're all just uncomfortable because this and then uh you know brady bernard kind of shuffles through and barges right. ahead of these guys and they're like no it's okay fine and, and they're all like wow that's a nice fellow I and mean, it, it it just i wanted to i wanted to set that stage and i also wanted to establish that Brady Bernard was kind of a Lee Oswald type guy. He was off. Mm-hmm. He was different. He had his social skills were not great. And again, this is my take on this character. This is I don't. Sure, I sure. never met Barney Baker, and I can yeah. only tell you what I read. Yeah, about. and let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that that writing process. So your mm-hmm. uh, events, you said, you know, loosely based and and sometimes closely based on some uh, events that either you've personally experienced or you are you read about. The same with with characters. So the, so there's some similarities between the, those characters and and what you believe to be the historical character. But you're also drawing from other people that 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 both you personally encountered, as well as you know. There's some semi autobiographical components to mm-hmm. characters. There are uh, and uh, amalgams of of people that you've met. How do you draw those things together? And I know my limits. I am not a good enough writer to just um, completely blue sky it, as I call it. Um, I have to have imagine someone from scratch. It's hard for me. Right. John Pilot is very similar to me. He is not me. And I and sure. it's a question I deal with a lot, and especially because <laughs> John Pilot. By the way, we haven't even talked about John much, but. John right. has John has John is an open wound, particularly in this book, in so many ways, and that's brought to life literally by Simon. But the point being, I I had tried for years to write stuff. I have four four failed novels in a drawer somewhere. They'll never see the light of day. They're just not very good. But there are things I had to write to learn to write. 
Um, right. And and that's there's people always kind of oh there's I wrote some bad stuff I'm so embarrassed I'm not embarrassed by it because that's what it was it was a writing learning process now if they one of them actually got published I'd be thrilled but it didn't happen so okay so I had to learn to write but that's why a lot of times I have a hard time like getting out of uh, the mold I'm in I like I would mm-hmm. love to write I love science fiction and I would love to write science fiction but mm-hmm. man. Um, I don't have a good frame of reference for how to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on some stuff. Right. And in fact, right. in, in pilot seven, there's some short stories. I actually put John pilot in a science fiction vibe in one of the stories and I was really pleased with it. But so mm-hmm. anyway, back to your question, I'm sorry, I I'm going on, but what I, I feel like this event, um, in 1950 that I took gave me like a cradle for me to birth this thing out of, you know, or not birth, but for me to kind of raise this, this thing up. And I needed sure. that because my creative process was, okay, here, you've got these people. Like, for example, I, I, my grandfather wrote historical fiction and mm-hmm. I think it helped him. He could make great characters, but it also, he had like the hang judge, judge Parker from Fort Smith. He would use him, mm-hmm. but it, you know, I, I like this because I can go, okay, I've got like this character. Now he's Brady Bernard. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, and I can kind of make him, he's, he's like a, uh, what do you call it? Maybe an anchor? An anchor. Yeah, thank you. And he's like an anchor or a foundation. Right, and I, right. And I can build so, him up. So you've got a skeleton. Yes. Uh, you've got a skeleton of, of, of some, maybe some kernels of true events. Right. And true, true people. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, you're adding to that skeleton adding right. some some sinew and and right and right well it, it's fl- like I've, flesh to it right and then the, and, and subsequent uh well like for example there's characters the, the modern characters too though it's like okay john pilot mm-hmm. obviously he's similar to me uh, uh his love interest kate is an amalgam of three or four p- women i've known in my life um you know trevathan the dean uh, right of the school he is very much like a dean i knew at a college i worked at um but okay. not completely he's also got a little okay. bit of my grandpa in him um, well hence the name it's the right? name trevathan right <laughs> but but he by the way my grandpa that was never as is ornery as as dean trevathan <laughs> dean trevathan's like a, kind of a, a son of a bitch through a lot of it but um so so yeah i'm sorry to take so long to answer that question because it's one that's no, it's no. hard to but i want to admit that 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 early on especially with this book Right. It, it's nerve wracking because I'm just because I, I really wanted to do well and I wanted to do right by the story. And I thought it was too good an opportunity to blow it by writing a crappy book. <laughs> very good. Very good. So so for as advice for other writers that are maybe leery of 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 using what they're close to and what they know, mm-hmm. what would your advice be. I, mean, I think I know the answer to this. But Well, the first thing is, is just remember this, and it's in the front of the, of the book, is this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, brands, media, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. The author sure. acknowledges the trademark status and trademark owners of various products referenced in this work of fiction, which have been used without permission. This publication use of these trademarks is not authorized, associated with, or sponsored by the trademark owners. That's your get right. out of jail free card, and I don't. I don't. I mean, it doesn't mean it gives you license to base on a living person, a store, a person, a character who is so obviously that person, and then you you make right. them into awful per. I mean, you don't want to slander anybody. Sure, um, but again, it's it's a work of fiction. So that's your ticket right there. Is like if you are like, I want to do a story, I want to write something, but I need a little help, uh, maybe getting that first bite of the apple. Mm-hmm. Finding mm-hmm. an historical event, particularly an historical event that's really not ever been used any, at any other time, sure. Hang your hat on that and build it out from that. I think there's nothing wrong. With, well, obviously, I think there's nothing wrong with that. You know, right? And right. I sweated it a little. I mean, the first two or three books, yeah. I kept thinking somebody's gonna like slam me for using this, and nobody ever did. And maybe it's because nobody heard about it or nobody read it. Although I did plenty of book signings here right. uh, here in Kansas City area and in Nebraska, and uh, never had anybody bring it up. Yeah, but but it was again. It's it's not identical. It's mm-hmm. just it's just inspired by just True. as your characters are inspired by pieces of yourself, pieces of friends, acquaintances, th- those you interact with. I think uh, don't hold me to this. I I. I know I read it somewhere that does not necessarily <laughs> mean it's true, but but that there was some some studies that that in uh, dream state the faces that you interact with in your dreams are, are are faces that you've you've seen 
it, it, and that your that your brain is incapable of of creating uh, uh, you know things from from scratch. So now I don't know if they piece can piece together the eyes of this person you saw on the bus <laughs> and the mouth of this uh, this person that you you tripped over at the Seven Eleven. But I think it's the same with the the creative process in uh, in in your writing as well. I think you're right. You know, I, it's such a great bit. I'm going to look that up. I'm curious about that. That's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you prove that, obviously, but I I think right. it's, it makes sense. You know, my favorite author is Gore Vidal, and one of my favorite books is Burr, and he he. He took he took Aaron Burr, who is even more maligned. I never thought that'd be more possible. The, the rise of the musical Hamilton has made Aaron Burr even more of a misunderstood villain in my eyes. But anyway, um, but but he but if you look at Gore Vidal, hell, most of his career is just taking like Gore Vidal's Lincoln. Gore, you know, uh, all these different books he wrote were based on historical events and historical figures, and he just brought them to life. He did a lot of great research, but obviously, he did mm-hmm. not have transcripts of conversations between <laughs> Theodosia Burr and, and her father and, you know, and, right, and, and Al right. Hamilton and all that. So you're, you're so filling you know, in blanks, you're yeah. filling in blanks and you're, you're fleshing things out and you're entertaining people that way. So I think that that's a, a very, thank you for that observation. I think that's a very valuable thing. And I also did salt this or spice this entire first book with, uh, you, you saw, mm-hmm. uh, I said, I sent you a few samples of some of the, uh, the affidavits. There's there's dozens of affidavits from witnesses. Right, right. Yes. I actually will confess to taking verbatim sentences from some of those affidavits and using them as dialogue. Well, and that makes it that makes it real. Yeah. And uh, and I, yeah, I, I like the idea of uh, the dialogue of each character inhabits their or exhibits their personality. Yeah. So, so the the way in which they speak isn't isn't Alex. No, it's 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 each character, and so some have uh, you know great grammar and diction, some not so much, uh, and uh, you know understanding that this is set in a in a you know more rural environment that that uh, uh, you know some are well educated, some some not so much, but all. Uh, that that again adds some uh, you know different. It, it adds just color and feel to to the to the book. It makes it more natural, relatable, believable. It's the verisimilitude is the word that you've got to have enough um, real, or it's it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. That's why the the worst science fiction, for example, is the stuff that is just so out there and. Uh, the dialogue is really robotic. There's nothing to connect it to real life at all. So right, there's no right. verisimilitude. There's there's not that spice that makes the spaghetti sauce, as Stephen King would say. Yeah. It's it's not there. Um, so I had to be careful that. And, and to me, though, it just... Uh, this Pilot's Cross was a labor of love, but it was hard. And if I had not had this framework to work from, and if I had mm-hmm. not had some things that kind of help me really flesh out characters and make them something beyond two dimensional kind of cutouts that you'd expect, right. uh, this because I view this book as a critical success when I say or, or a qualified success. Excuse me. Uh, I, I I think it's a successful first novel. Uh, is it the best thing I ever wrote? No, um, but am I proud of it? Yes. And was it a lot of hard work? Mm-hmm. Oh my god, yes. And <laughs> so it's it's right. and it's the one I def, it's the one I kind of. It's it's ironic because I have now soon seven books in the series, right? Right. Just and and again, you're you're in. We're about to celebrate ten years ten of years. the pilot. It'll be pilot December, books. yeah, December seventh or something like that is the tenth year. Yeah, and, wow. and, and and but it's like I hate to admit this, but some people say, "Oh, I want to start reading your series," and I'm like, I almost wish you didn't have to start with Pilots Cross. It's a good <laughs> it's a good book. It's to me, it's like right. Star Trek. Think about this, it's like the Star uh-huh. Trek movies, the original. It's like okay. Everybody loves Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, right? Yeah. But not everybody likes the movie that came before it, Star Trek The Motion Picture, because it's slower and it's it's a little clunky in places. It's bigger budget and it has mm-hmm. a, 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 probably a bigger story, but it's right. just not as interesting to most film fans as an exciting action film movie. Yeah. Okay, Pilots Cross could be Star Trek The Motion Picture, and then Pilots Key, the second <laughs> book, is Wrath of Khan. I mean, it's just the right. way it seems to have shaken out. That Pilots Key has sold triple the number of Pilots Crosses. Sometimes I just tell people start with Pilots Key, and if they like it, to go back. So for for a new reader, it's yeah. So this is almost this becomes the 
the the prologue to to the series. It's a good. It's but you know I don't want to sell it short. It's it's just it's, right. There's so much more exposition. It's the first book, and but the the problem is is I, I had a writer friend. Well, I'm not going to let you off the hook saying it's 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 exposition for the series because you didn't know you were writing a series. <laughs> he said there's just a lot of rookie exposition in here, and I'm like, well, I didn't know right. how any other way to tell the story, and it wasn't like that friend was like killing me for it he was just teasing me a little yeah. bit like please don't act like you were going to write the whole series because you told me yourself right. years ago you this is the one and done and sure get it out of my system but i couldn't i just couldn't so back to the the locale i wanted to mm, maybe yeah. drill in on that with as you know i kind of grew up in a, a small midwestern town I went to undergraduate at a uh, maybe a little bit larger, but not much larger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, That's where we uh, you know, small liberal arts college in a in a fairly rural area. Uh, so, so for me, I I think I'm one of many many people in the flyover states and flyover cities or towns that can just relate to the way that you describe the surroundings. Oh, so so for me that it's so it's we've talked all a lot about character, but 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 uh, creating a, a visual picture of the area is another uh, is another I think key to your creative process to drawing people in to the entire scene. You want to maybe talk about how you do that? As it well? makes me feel really good that you say that because frankly I think. Um... I'm not the best. That's not the strongest part of my work. I, I think I'm, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think I write pretty good. You already said this, really good dialogue, and and mm -hmm. I and and I, I bring characters to life that way. But I'm also fairly minimalist in describe. I am not one of those painterly writers who's got to describe everything and every stitch of clothing. I'm not doing a catalog, you know. So I don't right. want to describe every <laughs> stitch of clothing. I might describe one or two aspects of what they're wearing. And I might describe, see, this is what's interesting that you say this, because I might describe one or two things about where they are mm -hmm. or, or maybe a smell or, you know what I mean? Or a right. color of a leaf or, but that's about it. But if it's right. doing the job for you though, because apparently it, it puts you in the place. So. Yeah. And maybe it, it allows my imagination or the reader's imagination to fill in the blanks. I think you should. I think writers who, I don't, I don't like reading books where the writer is holding my hand the whole time. And I, okay. I purposely, by the way, go out of my way to not describe, nobody really knows what John Pilot looks like. Mm -hmm. um, now you have a better idea of Kate because one, you know, she has a great ass in her Levi's and she has blonde <laughs> hair, right? But, but uh -huh. that could be uh -huh. anybody. I mean, how many great right. blonde haired beauties have you seen in your day? You could, you make, mm -hmm. yeah, you make that any way you can. Uh, Trevathan, the one thing we know about Trevathan is that uh, his eye got damaged in the war in Vietnam. So he's, you, and he's got steel gray buzz cut or crew cut hair. That's it. And he's tall. And uh, Jack Lindstrom, well, I always draw, you know, I believe he has a goatee, but he also, uh, he has some kind of facial hair and he's, he's always impeccably dressed and, it, it, but impeccably dressed in this location is overly dressed. He's a little too much of a dandy for this, this job in this Ooh. town, which right. says a lot about him. Right. So, so I appreciate that. So when I'm doing things, I, like I said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be overly led by the author and therefore as a writer, I don't want to overly lead you either. Um, mm -hmm. I want to just give you a few little bits and pieces and apparently that does work to get you in the mood and because there's nothing better than your own imagination. Right. I view, I view my writing as a partner with your imagination. That's great. That's great. Yeah. It's, it, it, it works. And then from, from here, I, I, I will maybe skip around a lot, but, but, you know, John escapes the <laughs> you know cross town ship and, he survives, and then yeah. goes to to some more exotic locations right uh spend some time in in key west and and uh so so from a process standpoint was it it just an area that you fell in love with that that you personally wanted to to relay that love or or what was the the rationale for for jumping to to something that well, different. Pi yeah, Pilot goes from Pilot's Cross, as you said, he leaves Cross Township and then he goes to Key West, Florida for new adventures in Pilot's Key. But he still brings along with him people from Cross and that there, there's there's still plenty going on from Cross. But why did, right. that, why did that happen? Well, 
there's 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 something there is a theme with John Pilot is he's he's always running away from something usually himself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, right but he had this very traumatic he survives uh, sorry folks I if I'm if I'm giving you a spoiler here well there are seven <laughs> books so you he probably survived he survives but barely what happens in, in Cross Pilot's Cross and he he needs to rest and relax and recover and um and go there and so the reason that happened why you know people are like god key west that's a complete what who yeah well yeah the the reason is because i and here we go with mr imagination here my me again um my wife and i we got married in 2006 and Mm -hmm. we uh honeymooned uh we got married in florida and we honeymooned in the florida keys and actually, we stayed on Marathon. Don't do that. It's a, it's okay, but it's if, if you want like a lot of excitement and stuff and, and, and nightlife, which we did back at that time. We were younger than obviously than we are now. Um, Marathon wasn't it, but we took a day and went down all the way to Key West. And man, we had a blast. So right. much fun. I fell in love with conch fritters. We did a ghost tour of Key West. And, and boy, did that open up so many of the things. Like there's a whole practically chapter in Pilot's Key about all the weirdness of Key West because I wanted <laughs> and I wanted I wanted to go from Pilot's Cross where all this small town weirdness and I wanted to go to another small town because Key West is a tiny mm-hmm. town, too. It's on a tiny island. Right. It's right. the only part of the Caribbean the United States has. And it's right out there. And I thought I want to go to another a, a, a tiki drink flavored weird town and have some shit uh-huh. go on there and i wanted i wanted the whole idea and that may be by the way though where i finally came up with a character that loosely based on on a friend of mine but i i invented this new character that became huge with the with the readers of the same. taters malley was born in key west <laughs> and good, good old taters good old Tater. he was just sitting there having his breakfast and he, he and pilot actually almost get crossways in that first meeting and all but that character mm-hmm. he's loosely based on a buddy of mine but this buddy of mine mm-hmm. is not a crusty charter boat captain he is not a lot of these right, things right. but he just there's a certain aspect of his personality i thought ooh, that would work here pilot's key i wrote that so quickly yeah. Um, it's the Wrath of Khan of the series, and uh, it, it, it really has done well. I wrote it, I think I wrote it in three months, and then within another three months, it was, it was, it was, a, it was out. Wow. Yeah. It, wow. It, and well, I'd gotten my confidence finally from, right. uh, from right. Cross, and uh, so, um, that, that's how so it, it may be worked. reflecting back on, on your discussion of Pilot's Cross is you now have some some fleshed out characters that you just need to now drop into a, an interesting place in an interesting story. And, and that makes maybe the writing a little bit easier. I, you know, people have asked me before I've, I've been interviewed a little bit here and there and they said, you know, so tell me, you know, what is, what do, what do, what do readers like about your series? I say, well, here's what I think they like is like my mysteries are crap. Okay, there's there's not like Agatha Christie would is getting no uh, competition out of me. It's it's but here's what it is. I want to take interesting people, and I think I've got a mm-hmm. really nice uh, roster of interesting characters, and I drop them into mysterious or suspenseful or uh, thrilling mm-hmm. situations. And that there's a little right. bit. I, I'm being a little hard on the mysteries. I mean, you have to, there are some mysteries involved, and there's some guessing going on. But P- Pilot is not a detective. Pilot is just this guy. Right, and he right. just stumbles into shit, and he's got friends who help him. But more often than not, Pilot doesn't even survive by his wits. He just survives by <laughs> sheer luck. <laughs> right, right. But he, but he, yeah, but he has great. a blast doing it. And uh, although, you know, as we get closer into this last book that's coming out soon, uh, he's he's been put through the ringer, and he's got mental issues. Sure. And he always has. Right, right. And, and he is in, in, in at times in some very real danger. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, quite you know palpable, and he's trying to <laughs> trying to figure out how not to how not to die, right? Because it's like you know he was he was nearly killed in the first one and the second one and the third one. Well, he's nearly killed in all of them, and right. we we should probably talk about that. Uh, uh, but but uh, he as we can talk a little bit more about the books as we go forward. But he is mm-hmm. he's kind of an everyman, but maybe slightly off there here and there and uh but anyway i think that putting him in different places there's another book where he goes to jamaica uh he's probably going to go to another island nation in a book down the road 
Um, mm -hmm. But I'm always looking for an exotic locale where I can tell a little bit about that story and about that place uh, and kind of because I kind of stole that from James Bond. It's like okay. part of the thrill of, of a Bond film is to see him in an exotic locale and, and and trying to do his ply his wares there. So right, right, interesting, interesting. So one one last question. I I, I know we're running out of time. But I want to. I'd like to, if if you're willing, maybe uh, come back and do another episode. Oh, we're, uh, we haven't even finished here. We've got to get. We haven't even finished the entire uh, history issue of Peru exactly, State and exactly. uh, Cross Township. Correct. Correct. Yeah. But uh, but, but I did want to ask you. Uh, so you mentioned Tater, mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned John as an as an everyman. Mm -hmm. Is 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 Tater, in a lot of ways, maybe the the sensibility or the the conscience or sensibility of the everyman although you also have simon right <laughs> well see i love where you're going because here we'll go back to star trek for a minute they often say that kirk spock and mccoy are the id the ego and the super ego right interesting okay. now now think about this taters simon and uh pilot is the it's the id the ego and the super ego by the way, listeners, if you haven't read, Simon is kind of a doppelganger that, you know, you're not sure, especially after this first book, if he's actually real or if he's just in Pilot's head or what's going on with that. Or is it like a sixth sense kind of deal? I had people used to think that all the time. They're like, it's like the sixth sense, isn't it? Pilot's dead or this is that. And I was like, well, it could be. And I was like, God, that's better than what yeah, I wrote. Just read on. Continue yeah. to read. Yeah, but please keep reading, even though I don't have anything yeah. near that interesting. I think Taters is definitely... That aspect, though, the everyman, he is uh, he's there to keep pilot grounded in a way mm -hmm. that a woman, a, a sexual and romantic partner can't because right, pilot right. has some issues and uh, that 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 are on. By the way, pilot's mental issues are part of an enormously long arc through this whole series. But I feel sorry for women who fall for, for pilot because he's he's damaged. He's broken in places. And sure. and sometimes the strain of a romantic relationship pushes hard on those broken places and he right. he lashes out and reacts poorly um mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he has issues about being needed and wanted and desired and and truly loved so but mm -hmm. with a uh, with taters who is not just a in in he's a lot like hmm he is the guy who kind of grounds pilot and i and i, I say this because I've, I've never really told you this that much but um, you being a my my, my longest term guy friend, I mean there is some of you there because mm -hmm. there is a love that that Taters and Pilot have for each other that that now you and I are better at expressing that with each other, but th their right. expression of it's a little more like another buddy of mine who's got some of the physical characteristics of Tater and some of the kind of the weird mm -hmm. uh, weird sense of humor that's that's Taters. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He and I care about each other too, but it's not like we. It's not like you and right, I express right. it. And I'm, I'm not, it's not bad. It's not good. It's, it's just different people. Sure. So, so the every man, yeah. But I like to look at him more as not quite every man, but more as like, this is the anchor. This is the guy who, when pilot is losing his mind, he's like, Hey buddy, let's, let's have a Modelo and calm down here, man. You know, <laughs> cause you do that for me all the time. You're like, when 